All right, great. Thanks everybody for joining. We're really happy to have JP Morgan Chase Chair. Chairman and CEO Jamie Diamond return again to the conference. Jamie, thanks so much for joining us today. Thrilled to be here. Thank you. So you hosted an investor day last week for your investors and yeah. analysts. Um, a lot of generalists in the audience today probably didn't get a chance to listen in. Maybe you could take a few minutes to summarize the key takeaways that you and your team wanted to convey at your investor day last week. Yeah. So uh, we did have investor day. It was long. It went from like eight to three o'clock. All the major Executives made presentations, including one on tech, one on CCB, CIB, asset wealth management, payments, uh, markets, et cetera. And the, the point was, is that, you know, we ha really hadn't spoken to investors in detail for two years. So some had complained that we're spending a lot of money, a lot of issues out there. We've done a bunch of acquisitions and they were right. So we took the time to explain it in detail about why we're spending uh, $6 billion more in 2022 versus 2021 how we look at investments. And it was a lot of detail in that, like, you know, how we look at application investments, how we look at acquisition investments, how we look at new branches and bankers and, and uh, you know, hardware and software and modernization, all that. And so you got to go through the detail, but that's, you know, how you have to run a business is at a very uh, detailed level. We gave some updates and things which don't surprise people very much on NAI, uh, you know, for this year and, you know, kind of a first view about kind of a benchmark for maybe be next year. Um, and we spoke, obviously spoke about the economy and stuff like that. I also think it's a great chance for you all to see our senior management team in person, answering questions up on stage, explaining their business, why they're doing what they're doing. Uh, you know, a couple of things are different. A couple of things are, are, are not completely normal. And we didn't describe everything. I think sometimes we describe too much and give away too many things that help, uh, help uh, investors. And after that, I went to uh, Fidelity in Wellington. And I went up to Boston, did a kind of a Boston tour, and a couple people were asking some really great questions, which were exactly the ones we didn't want to answer. And because we're not going to, but there's, you know, there's other great, great stuff we're doing. We're quite comfortable with the company and we're quite comfortable with how we uh, make these investments and such. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, traditionally, JP Morgan has been a stock for all seasons. It's done well in good <laughs> markets and tough markets, and particularly in down markets have been defensive. Do you think the characteristics of, of what's built the company historically and the balance sheet and the diversity are still true today and could make it perform well on a tough day? T totally. I mean, you know, what protects a company in a downturn is, first of all, you're prepared. But, you know, we, we always talk about through the cycle. So we acknowledge when we're over earning on credit and that that's going to normalize. We're quite clear about that. And that might be $3 billion to charge us more a year. And we have to prepare for things like CECL and AOCI and downturns and all that. But your, be your best preparation is that Fortress balance sheet. It's conservative accounting. We don't have a lot of, not a lot. We have almost no one-time gains or losses or MSR. I mean, even when you look at MSR, that's conservative too, because there's very little FHA service in there. When things go bad, FHA servicing is very expensive when the delinquencies hit 5 or 10%, which is guaranteed to happen in a downturn. And it's the same with, you know, look at our real estate portfolios. They're mostly, the ones you worry about are mostly class A, fully leased up, no spec, you know, all these various things, which is hard to look at, but that protects you. And those margins, when, when things get bad, we'll still have margins, but still be making money. And the reason we want to do that is so we can serve clients in the toughest of times. And, uh, and we have plenty of capital, plenty of balance sheet. There's a lot of capital uncertainty because we still don't know SCB. We don't know if there'll be any adjustment to GCFI which we're not counting on. We did some acquisitions, which took away from some buyback capability. Though, you know, I much prefer to do really smart acquisitions and stock buyback. You may not like that so much sometimes because you want uh, consistency and all that. But uh, uh, so, yeah, we'll, we'll be a fortress balance sheet in the next go around too. And we're, you know, we're quite concerned about the environment. So, you know, we, I try to separate for the analyst committee what it, right now, if you have a benign environment, like you all have forecasts, which in your forecast, What's well, your forecast as a benign environment? I don't know what it's going to be like by the end of the year. You know, I'm prepared for a non-benign environment by the end of the year. So you know, to me, it's, we try to explain all that as best we can. And I think it's important we do that. Mm -hmm. But we will be prepared for bad outcomes. And, and on that front, uh, what degree of difficulty do you attach to the task at hand in front of the Fed right now? And you mentioned storm clouds. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to change about. the storm clouds because I said... I said there are three things that we're going through, which are, I hate the word unprecedented, which are kind of unprecedented. 
And you got to put this in the back of your mind when you haven't, when you've seen things that have never happened before, then you have to question your ability to predict. Okay. One is huge growth in this country driven by fiscal and monetary stimulation. That isn't a normal recovery. Okay. And that, that fiscal stimulation is still in the pocketbooks of consumers. They're spending it. They're spending it at very strong levels. For, and the data is completely distorted. It's distorted by inflation. It's distorted by, they went from goods back to services. It's distorted by all these things. But jobs are plentiful. Wages are going up. Consumers are spending. The, the lower income folks, not quite as much as before, but everybody else, it looks like they have $2 trillion more. Savings rate drop. I don't think that's going to stop the spending the six or nine months. And, and so, it, it, as, so that, that to me is the bright clouds out there. Uh, but it's different. The Fed has to meet this now with raising rates and QT. And the new part of this isn't the raising rates, it's the QT. The QT has, we've never had QE before like this. Therefore, we've never had QT like this. So you're looking at something they're going to be writing history books on for 50 years. What was QE? What worked? What didn't work? I think a lot of parts of QE backfired. I think the negative rates was probably a huge mistake for a whole bunch of different reasons I'm bore you with now. Uh, but they're going to have to raise rates. And they, in my view, they have to do QT. They do not have a choice because there's so much liquidity in the system. They have to remove some of the liquidity to stop the speculation, to reduce home prices, stuff like that. And you've never been through QT. So all the major buyers, if you, look, if you go back to 2010 and say, who are all the major buyers of treasuries all that time? It was central banks, foreign exchange managers, banks who were topping up their liquidity profiles because we had to for regulations. All three, it it's, won't happen, the go round. Banks are topped up, foreign exchange matters are topped up, the central bank will be selling, not buying, and governments have much more fiscal deficit to finance. That's a huge change in the flow of funds around the world. I don't know what the effect of that is. I'm prepared for, I can tell you, a minimum huge volatility. And the third thing is Ukraine. Okay, you've not had a European land war since 1945. Okay, and, you, and, the, the, and the complexity of Ukraine is we don't know the outcome. I always make a list, you know, if you predict the outcome, well, you couldn't predict the outcome of Vietnam, Korea, Afghanistan, Iraq, 10 other conflagrations, all wrong. Wars go bad. They go south, they have unintended consequences. And this happens to be whirling the commodity markets of the world, wheat, oil, gas, and stuff like that, which in my view will continue. We're not taking the proper actions to protect Europe from what's going to happen in oil in the short run. And we're not taking the proper actions to protect you all for what's going to happen to oil in the next five years, which means it almost has to go up the price. We're not investing enough money you know, uh, to keep oil a number. And for all those who love climate change, if oil prices go to 175 or 150, which I, I kind of think is in the cars, to tell you the truth, you know, not in the immediate run, but down the road, then CO2 won't go up, down, which is everyone predicts because people buy less oil and gas. It's going to go up because all those other countries out there, the poor countries who need oil and gas to feed and heat their, their citizens, will turn off, will not buy oil and gas, they'll buy coal. That's what's going to happen. CO2 will go up, it won't come down. And we're not, we're not dealing with these challenges. So those three things, fiscally induced growth, QT, Ukraine war, so I, I'm going to change the storm clouds out there because I look, I'm an optimist. You know, I, I, I said there are storm clouds, there are big storm clouds. There, It's a hurricane. It's we, right now. It's kind of sunny. Things are doing fine. You know, everyone thinks the, the Fed can handle this. That hurricane is right out there down the road coming our way. We just don't know if it's a minor one or Superstorm Sandy or uh, yeah, Sandy or or uh, Andrew or something like that. And it's you, you, you better brace yourself. So JP Moore is bracing ourselves, and we're going to be very conservative in our balance sheet. On you know, with all this capital uncertainty, we're going to have to take actions. And you know, I kind of want to shed non non operating deposits again, which we can do in size, you know, to protect ourselves, so we can serve clients in bad times. And so that, that's the environment we're dealing with. And you know, I, I'm I think it's okay to hope that will end up okay. I hope it. That's my Goldilocks. I hope. Who the hell knows? What do you think it means for the potential credit cycle that might ensue and the preparedness of the banking it, it, industry? It, it, the banking industry is in great shape and credit cycles follow a norm. Okay. And even in the great financial recession, it followed a norm with a couple of little exceptions. 
mortgages, there was a trillion dollars actually to be lost. You, we all woke up sometime in 08 or 09 and said, my God, it's a trillion dollars. And it was everywhere. It wasn't derivatives. No, I was in CLOs. It was in banks. It was in insurance companies. It was, but that caused panic because people woke up and the investors and they said, my God, it's everywhere. What do you do? You sell. You know, so it was panic selling and stuff like that. And I think you may see that again, by the way, too, because I, I don't think that banks can intermediate in the markets that we're used to. So when, when all this liquidity gets run down, you, we're going to hit a wall. And then when that wall gets hit in terms of intermediation, you're going to see very volatile markets again. And no one's going to be able to step in other than the Fed, which maybe they can't do this time. So, um, but the credit cycle follows a norm normally. And, you know, and that's the minimum you should expect. And we've shown people, you know, credit card, I mean, it's all time lows today, but, you know, in the Great Recession, it hit, peaked at 10%. We would have told you before that 8%, so we were, you know, off, but not that much. What surprises people is it won't be mortgage this time. It won't be, we don't see it there. It might be something in the private credit markets. You had okay goes. I mean, when things happen, it will, someone will get hurt uh, somewhere. Uh, and sometimes it's industries you just least expect. And so you have to be very careful in that. Like in, oh, oh, in the zero zeros, it was telecom and utilities, the ones that were the most stable. You know, in 07, 08, it was Warren Buffett and newspapers. I mean, so you know, there's, there's underlying changes in credit. You have to be very careful about it. Very hard to spot. And therefore, the discipline is you never put all your eggs in one basket. You're very careful. No matter how people, people think real estate or something like that. And so anyway, you will have a normal credit cycle. Uh, charge offs will go up. We'll, we'll still be earning money. Cecil makes it very volatile. You know, like I, I think I pointed out investor today, we put up in two quarters. So the first quarter of 2020, the second quarter, $15 billion of Cecil. And then the next four quarters, we took it down. I mean, I don't know what kind of accounting that is. I think it's crazy. I don't know who invents this shit, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but we have to deal with it regardless. There's been a big expansion of credit outside the banking system. You kind of referenced that. Is, is, is that a concern in, in your mind in terms of... You, it's, you, hard, it's hard to tell. You know, this is the private... More, I mean, I, look, I think some of these direct lenders are very smart people. And you got you had uh, you know you had Blackstone here. You have Aries and Oak. They're all very smart. It's huge numbers now. The issue for the world is that those those borrowers may be stranded when the shit is the fan, because these people cannot roll over that credit at thirteen or fourteen percent. They, they're going to have to charge thirteen or fourteen percent, and so they're going to call up JP and say, "Will you, can you, will you have us back?" You know, and we're gonna, in some cases we're going to say no because you know we'll have tapped out what we can do too because we also hit our own uh, uh, red lines and stuff like that. So is that systemic? I don't know. There's a lot of leverage lending out there. Will someone get hurt? Probably. Will that credit dry up in that segment of the market? Probably. Uh, are there other things we see out there that are particularly bad? No, but we have this little report we have called shadow banking. And you put it all together, you know, middle, you know, from repo to money market funds to commercial paper to CLOs to you know mortgage banking. The mortgage businesses have moved away from banks for good reason. You know, the capital and liquidity requirements are so high at a bank, it really doesn't belong in banks anymore. And you know, will they be able to make mortgages when the shit is fan? Maybe not. I mean, if you even today, if you look at private label mortgages, they're 50 to 75 basis points higher than what retail banks are doing, you know, and the only way the other folks can finance it is by securitizations. I don't know why a retail bank is issuing something at four and a quarter when you can buy it in the marketplace at five. So I, you have to question that logic a little bit. And so you're going to see this stuff is going to get worse if the markets get tighter mm -hmm. and you know, liquidity dries up a little bit. We will be prepared for it. And uh, so should you, if you were smart. Talk about some of the industry issues that you're dealing with in terms of expense pressures. How much of the inflation burden are banks likely to see, and where are you it's, seeing that now? It's no different than everywhere. You know, uh, uh, it's. I mean, you see it every day now. Like, but this when we told you all numbers that we kind of embedded that in. I don't know what other people did when they told you their numbers. We were embedding in. You know, you can embed in your own number, four percent, five percent, but it, it's it's relentless. And so you're going to see a lot of people making adjustments. And by the way, I want to keep our best people. So, you know, like, uh, you know, we, we have to pay well to keep our best people. We're quite religious about that. And it, it'll be what it is, you know. Remember, there are benefits from inflation, too. Like, NII is going to be much higher. And, you know, it's not, it's not a one thing. But 
uh, but you're going to see it. And I think you see a lot of banks, tech companies. Uh, I think a lot of companies are, are facing it. And yeah. yeah. But you, but you, when you guys do your own estimates for 2023, you should tell me what you think it should be. Because I could be thinking 5%, and you're thinking two, or you're thinking two, and I'm, think, I'm thinking two, and you're thinking five. And, you know, it'll, it'll be what it is at that point. We will deal with intelligently. We'll manage our expenses like we always have. And, uh, you know. and for banks. Or and, and, and in 2023, remember, it, it, if you have a, if a severe recession starts, you know, sometime in 2023, inflation, you know, wage inflation go, can go to zero, like literally overnight. So. And how about capital? Uh, there's capital pressures are growing on yourself and other banks from a combination of the macro environment and yeah. also the regulatory rules. How does that influence? Well, it's, mo- it's mostly it's, it's mostly accounting rules. Mm. You know, AOCI and CISOL and and uh, so and yeah, it'll QE, it'll it'll yeah. conscript, but we do a little bit and GCFE and you got to predict project forward and all that. And so, um, how does that affect you know your plans for growth and how you allocate capital? It, it, not it doesn't affect our plans for growth in terms of growing our company, all those investments we're making. It will affect how we deal with non-operating deposits what we put on the balance sheet or not, what we sell or not. We could be much more aggressive about what's on the balance sheet and what's not. There are a lot of things we simply don't have to keep or don't have to do. Some are to f- facilitate markets. Some are to help clients. And so you're, you know, if we have to, we'll, we'll tighten that up too. And we're probably going to. But, uh, earlier in the year, you, you laid out a medium term ROTC target of 17% yeah. with the investor day. It, it was never a medium term target. <laughs> That is what we expect to earn through the cycle. I'm getting rid of the medium. I don't even know what medium term means. I remember when I first got to Bank One, no, at JP Morgan, I said we aspire, maybe it was Bank One, we aspire to earn 15% in tangible equity. And inside the company, it was like an aspiration. And people thought I didn't mean it. So I eventually <laughs> said, no, that's your freaking target, buddy. Like, that's what you're going to earn. Like, that's what you should be earning. Let's not, let's not pretend. So we said 17% is what we expect to earn through the cycle, and we have. And, and, but, but the way I look at it is through the cycle. So this cycle, we're under-earning NII. We're over-earning in credit. We still got 17% last year, or better. You know, or you, I don't really include c loan there because that just swings around just too much. But I obviously include charge-offs and stuff like that. And you know, next year, NII is going to be a nice kick it for us and expenses are going up a bit and all that. So it's still 17, you know, and if you have a recession, well, it won't be 17. You know, it'll be something lower, you know, like that's life. And, but I also told our CFO, Jeremy Barham to do a little calculation. You can, anyone have a 12 C in front of you, uh, HP 12 C, whatever it is, do the calculation that if JP Morgan earns 17% in capital and grows at 7% a year, for how many years does it take before we're 50% of the GDP of the United States of America? I mean, I would take 17% all day long. Okay, that's pretty good. Now, you all don't earn 17% in your capital. Okay. <laughs> One of the drivers this year is uh, loan growth, and you're looking for loan growth to be you know, kind of growing in the high single digits. How broad-based is that, and, and then how does the hurricane kind of factor into yeah. that uh, you know, Again, you have to separate the hurricane from yeah. running the business day to day, and that hurricane is making us, you know, be careful in how we're running the business day to day. Loan growth is an output. If you run a bank and you think, you know, a lot of loans, you do not want loans. A lot of loans have a suboptimal return. If I generate a loan and I put it on my balance sheet, which you can buy the same loan in the market. Okay, without any overhead, why would I have 240,000 people doing that a year? Why don't you just have no people and buy the loan? That's called a fund. And so the, the reason you do a loan is because you're building a business that for every loan, and for the most part, loans are priced at the market. And of course, with regulations, you know, and one day I'm going to show you a chart. If I have to hold twice as much capital as somebody else, then somebody else should own the loan. Now, I may not be able to do it overnight. You're damn straight I'm going to do it over time. Why we own loans that you can hold much more profitably than me? And so, you know, to me, it's going to be, we're, you got to recycle your capital. And it happens in some markets and not in others. Uh, but loan growth is an outcome. If you don't have the whole business, you wouldn't probably be in the business at all. 
And the whole business is, and it's, think of the subscription businesses, cash management, custody, other flows, fee businesses, you know, the relationship. So you know, one of the benefits of the JP Morgan, we make it, and this is why we're doing unit tranche lending now. Like in unit tranche lending, they're bigger loans. They're priced better than our term A, term B, and sub and all stuff like that. You're getting paid more per dollar risk. And, but that's all they get. And, you, and, and then people invest in that. We get that plus all this other stuff. That's why we do it. I wouldn't do it just to get that. And so you got to be very careful when you're a bank about why you're a bank at all. And uh, so loans are an outcome of, and obviously the outcome of growth and the economy and all that. So we see a lot of today, middle market companies are taking, you know, they kept the revolvers. They need more to finance their inventory, the receivables and CapEx, which seems to be going up a whole bunch of different places. So it looks right now, you got pretty decent loan growth this year. We may very well reduce what we hold in the balance sheet, which is a different issue. That's more of a best execution issue to us or managing the balance sheet. Mm. So, but the loan growth itself, it looks to be pretty robust right now. How about the demand on the consumer side? Are they revolving a little bit more on cards? And, and what are you seeing in terms of consumer demand? And I, honestly, values? I haven't looked at it since investor day, so I don't yeah. want to update that. Yeah. Okay. But, but, but I've been clear from then, I expect that to happen. Mm-hmm. Now, you can guess when it's going to happen, but it's like a given. And, and you already see it in subprime. So my guess is it'll just happen in prime a little bit later, but it's the same basic thing. <laughs> You mentioned managing the non-operating deposits. But also, Marianne always points out that you got to look at two things. Well, NII went down because Revolve went down. Chargers went way down because Revolve went down. So they, they, they have some relation between the two. Mm-hmm. In terms of industry deposits, do you, do you expect deposits to leave the banking system as QT gets going? And you mentioned yourself I, I, managing I, non-operating. I want to push them out. I mean, I'm on the other side of this one. I want to... Uh, we, we have a lot of non operating deposits we keep as a service to clients. I don't know. I mean, I, but, uh, but, but the issue, the issue for the industry is what happens when they reverse QT and what does it come out of first? And we don't really know. Like I said, we've never had QT. If I had to tell you my current thinking, it's at first you're going to see a reduction in money market funds kind of wholesale related deposits. The Fed RRP facility is now an astounding $2 trillion. But eventually you're going to see it filter into consumer. Because when, when we had QE, if I remember correctly, and actually we should get this data because we did some real work way back when, that, that first QE showed up in wholesale deposits, but eventually morphed into consumer deposits. And so you're going to see that. So we, again, we have to be prepared for both. Like what's, where's the runoff going to be? So we, you know, we, I think uh, Jeremy gave you guys a number about expected deposit growth with all of our assumptions, and that number is probably still pretty good. And I gave that it could be plus or minus 300 billion or 400 billion. Mm-hmm. But again, if it's 400 billion and it comes out of non operating deposits, it doesn't really mean that much to us. And maybe you could talk a little bit to these folks here today about the investment agenda that you laid out at the investor day. Just you've got a leadership position in most of your businesses. Yeah. So where are the opportunities yeah. you see that are yeah. attractive? But the team showed, which I think is really important, not just where we're a leader, but where we're not. You know, like you, you could be number one in fixed income trading, but we you know we're number four in Asia. We're number seven in this country. We're number 10 in FX in this country. We're number. So if you look at all the weak spots where we don't have big shares, we don't, you know, like even our Chase Wealth Management, because uh, Jen and Marion showed, you know, the, the huge growth opportunities, but we have like a one and a half percent share and, you know, from a hundred thousand to $5 million of assets under management. Why not 10? And, you know, J- Jen mentioned that, you know, someone, I think someone's got a 20% share in deposits. I'm talking about 10 or 15 years from now, you know, because that's almost every other country has that. And if, as you add services and products. So, uh, but anyway, bran- the way we look at it, branchers, bankers, and these could be, and we don't, we're not going to give you all the numbers. There's some are embedded in the presentations. But open in a branch, we know exactly the profitability pretty much is going to be down the road. And we've been positively surprised. And now we're in 48 states. Hiring bankers in middle market or Chase Wealth Management Bankers, we pretty much know what the outcome is going to be. And we've been positively surprised. Marketing is, you know, that can go up or down. So we sit here and, you know, Mary answered a number, $7 billion of marketing. Another accounting ridiculous thing is 
In a lot of the credit card business, it's expensed against NII in 12 months. So you don't see it. The only thing you, know, you see, we tell you about that, but I mean, I don't know. That does, doesn't seem to be matching revenues and expenses to me, just like Cecil does and AOCI does. And, and you know, banks like the only industry where everything, all the losses are upfronted, you know, and everything else is on the come. And which hurts capital, by the way, it hurts capital formation and banking, which I, again, think is a, is a minor mistake. But, uh, but that, that, those numbers could double, you know, you could have a billion dollars of opportunity that gets very high returns or it can disappear right away. And, you know, the other lesson, actually probably a secret lesson is sometimes when things get bad, that marketing money is worth more, not less, because you get far more bang for the buck. So you got to be a little careful. That's why I don't like making promises on expenses at all. You know, if we can spend $500 million more on marketing credit card or marketing, something like this, and the returns are extraordinarily high, we're going to seize it and then explain it to our shareholder, you know, just like you would if you owned 100% of the company. And, and then we then we went, the, the harder ones are, and every business went through stuff they're doing, some of the tech, and we gave like very specific things, just some examples of AI, okay, where we know we're spending, we didn't tell you how much we're spending, but there's a billion dollars of identifiable benefit. I, we gave one, I'll give you one example on risk and fraud. Our risk and fraud in the consumer bank is losses are coming down while volumes over the years have doubled. And you, you all know how much fraud is out there today. That's AI. A couple of other examples like that. And AI does things like hedging a lot of our equity portfolios today, which is astronomical in a way you couldn't do as a human being. And then we gave specific examples on software we're building that has identifiable returns and some that doesn't really. Now, some of the modernization stuff and uh, data center stuff, but even like the data center stuff, we know when we move some of the new data center that the operating costs for that application drop 20 or 30%. And it becomes accessible to far more services. It's kind of invaluable, but so we try to give people a taste for all those things. And, you know, the 77 billion, about 15 billion is what we call investments. And, you know, we try to have rigor around those. And, um, and in terms of how the investment agenda gets set at JP Morgan, it's not diamond set, it's from the top down, right? It does come from the bottom up and people come to you with ideas. It, it's, and, it's a little bit of both. Hmm. So, and it should be like, so people, we ask them, what do you want to do? How do you want to do it? What are your opportunities? And they, that surfaces up. Some things, and, uh, and we don't tend to, if they're obvious, we tend to let them do it, okay? But there's certain things that have to be set at the top. Modernization has got to be set at the top. Certain things, you know, the, we, we have to, like I've been a lot of companies where operations is always underinvested in because no one sets a budget for operations. If you have operations, but it's in the CIB or the company, the, the rebuild and fixing and technology that's, that supports operations has got to be budgeted centrally. If it's budgeted in a, in a fight, front office will always win. And the new data centers will never be built. So the new data centers were top down. Some of the modernization is top down. Some of the other stuff that's in like, if you ask Daniel Pinto in the CIB is top down. And then other stuff bubbles up. It's both. So from the outside, how should we gauge the success of the investments over time? I mean, uh, just in terms of how it plays to your operating metrics, ROE. Well, we, I, I mean, we try to show you the, uh, uh, tons of examples that should give you comfort in how we go about it. But at the end of the day, do we earn 17% on tangible equity through the cycle? And do we grow? Do we compete? You know, because it's very easy not to grow. It's very easy not to invest in your future and have higher margins. I also think I've always been opposed to this concept of, you know, ever increasing margins. I, I don't know what people are thinking. We live in a capitalistic world. So, you know, when people, I remember that when City was under all the, you know, they're constantly increasing their margins and they're, so they're increasing operating leverage. Well, what do you increase operating leverage to? You know, Jeff Bezos says, you know, your margin is my opportunity. So we take, you know, very often we're giving the customer a better deal. That's what we do. It's called capitalism. You all do it, required. You know, to think that you can honestly always increase your margins is a mistake. As long as you're building a great company with great returns, great customer results, you know, good growth and stuff like that, you should be happy with your company. Mm -hmm. In addition to the organic investments. But the other thing you keep in mind is if we don't think the stuff is working, we can cancel it. We're not like the federal government. You start a program that doesn't work and it's there 30 years later. <laughs> you know, we can cancel it. And we, we apply rigor looking backwards about some of the stuff we did that didn't work or did work. Or um, so. You've been using uh, fill in, bolt on M&A a little bit more in the past couple of years, in addition to the organic investments. Well, what's the change that led to that? 
Or, well, I, I think for a long time, we wouldn't have been allowed to do acquisitions for a whole bunch of different reasons. And, and the other thing, which I think is very important, every, I think every company should, I, I grew up in an environment where every time a business wasn't doing well, at the management meeting, you quickly would start bullshitting about M&A. Well, we need to have size and scope. No, no, I think every business should have your own plan, how you can build it, how you're going to compete organically. And organic growth is the hardest growth. Adding a sales force is hard. Adding research is hard. Adding branches is hard. And you can't turn them on and turn them off. And so I always tell people, no, you have a job, organic growth. That, that's a huge discipline to add bankers and clients and services and products. And, and it's the best growth. It's your culture. It's consistent. It's, you know what it is. It's like our opening branch. Today. Like, you know, Doug Petno showed a chart. Since WAMU, where do we open? We're now in all 75, I think all 75 major cities. You know, we were in 25 of them. We started before WAMU. You know, getting him to open in every, not getting him, he wanted to, but to open in every place, to hire bankers, to add the credit officers, to add the treasury services, product managers. It's a lot of work, you know, and, but it's great work because the returns are enormous. And, you know, I, I could have bought, a, we, we, were, we couldn't buy another bank, but acquisitions are also very hard. They shouldn't detract from organic. So years ago, I was told you all, we want to, oh, I'd rather invest in our own business organically, M&A after a dividend and then buy back. And, and so I think, uh, I think acquisition opportunities opened up and we started to take them. And I want the management team to be looking and they're disciplined enough that they can grow organically and look, as opposed to it distracts. Sometimes it does distract you from going organically. You know, when you do a big acquisition, you know, all of a sudden all your teams are focused on consolidating and putting things together and management team and kind of innovation and organic growth drops by the wayside. It doesn't have to, but it often does. Is there any kind of common denominator or thread of the type of things you'll do inorganically versus build? No, if you, in asset management, you'd all understand this. We bought a company that manages Timberland. We bought a company that does uh, tax, it takes single accounts, MSAs and does tax advantaged investing. So it automatically adjusts for it. And a company that does ESG, open invest, where you can basically say, I like this index, but I want to over index to boards that have more women on them or that have to do a better job on scoring on this climate score, ESG. So you can run a portfolio and then you know, direct it the way you want. In, in, uh, in payments, you know, we, you got to look at Viva as capabilities is extraordinary. So it's just kind of a fabulous add on for us. And, and uh, a little bit, the one that's a little bit different is the stuff we did in travel. You know, uh, CX Loyalty, a rewards company, and Frosh, a uh, travel agent. But, but, but it's fabulous stuff, and we expect it all to pay back. And not only, not only pay back and defend the business, it'll also defend the business. So, you know, we have to execute. But the fact is, I think it was a fabulous strategy, and I congratulate them for even coming up with all of that. And uh, we've got some very competitive folks there who want to win big time in Travel. The other amazing thing, you know, and we, I always say, is there a reason you'd win? One quarter of all U.S. travel goes through our credit card. That's a that's a huge number, and only a portion of that goes through our own travel related stuff. And even if we can increase that portion even a little bit, it's fabulous for the client, it's fabulous for the company, and it's hugely competitive, and def- offensive and defensive. In terms of the competitive environment, and as long as I've been doing this, you've always said, as a financial institution, there's competition <clears throat> everywhere from every angle, always. Uh, but with the rise of fintechs and, and maybe big tech looking at financial services, has the nature or intensity of competition changed in recent years? Well, I think in the recent months, it's come down a little bit. Yeah. Uh, look, I think there's going to be a lot of winners and losers in this. And I, what I was trying to point out is that 20 years ago, if I was sitting here our competition was mostly other banks around the world, U.S., around the world, stuff like that. And now you have very intense shadow banks. Think of Citadel, the mortgage brokers, direct lenders, a lot of uh, payments companies, exchanges, data companies. But they're, they're, they're skimming off a lot of profit from the financial system. And then you have fintech. And they're good ones and not but Stripe and PayPal and IDN and and Square, and they're all doing interesting stuff. And then you got big tech. So big tech, you've all seen Apple has made their announcements about they want to do P2P. They've already got the Apple wallet. They want to give you some kind of credit journey experience. 
They're going to do merchant processing. They're going to do merchant lending. It may not be their own balance sheet, but that's, that's a bank. That's a bank. You know, may not have insured deposits, but it's a bank. If you move money, hold money, you know, manage money, lend money, that's a bank. And, you know, and then everyone's going to try to embed payment systems in their ecosystems. It just, you know, makes sense. Uh, you know, it could be as a bank, it could be white labeled, it could be, which we're not going to do, but you're, someone will do it. Or it could be they'll give you a marketplace. You know, uh, so there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of competition coming. And the reason I talk about it is not, I'm not afraid of it. I'm in favor of competition and there are strengths and weaknesses for banks. Uh, but, you know, you, you better not put your head in the sand. I mean, the worst thing a CEO can do at a company is, is have this ABC, arrogance, bureaucracy, or complacency. If you put your head in the sand, you die. I, and I think that I'm just trying to note that. I think J.P. Morgan's in pretty good shape. Uh, I think the competition is going to be brutal and fun to watch. And I think a lot, there'll be a lot of losers in it too, by the way. You've written about the need for a level playing field between banks and new entrants. Uh, how much? Uh, I didn't say been? that. I simply, because we're not going to get a level playing field. I, I just don't expect, the, the regulators aren't going to change anything on banks at this point. But, but what I was pointing out is that among the things we have to deal with is we have capital requirements, some of these people don't. We have liquidity requirements, some of these people don't. We've got social requirements, some of these people don't. We've got AY, AML, KYC, which they have in some capacity, but they don't. You know, we've got insurance requirements, they don't. We've got resolution requirements, they don't. We've got, that's, I'm just pointing out the truth. It, it is what it is. Just acknowledge it. That's all. And, you know, if they ever want to change, change it, then, then let them change it. I, I can't rely on any of those things being changed. You know, it's been 10 years since Basel, and we're still talking about Basel IV. And we still know what it is. You know, so that creates uncertainty for banks. I, you know, it's not what I like, but that's my, that's my lot in life. I got to deal with it. Uh, on the consumer side, uh, Marianne and Jen touched a bit on this last week. You, you reach over 66 million American households, got a dominant footprint in retail banking. What's the strategy to connect with younger generation as they begin to uh, build wealth and, and connect with them on broader levels? Yeah, well, they, I think I've got the numbers they put up there, but we already have a huge share of Gen Z and millennials. So it isn't like we're missing anything. And, you know, they like our product, like our service, they like our Sapphire card. And then we added things like self-directed investing, you know, which we acknowledge we didn't have the best platform of all, but it's already up to 50 or $60 billion. You know, so it's there. So you can now go on your phone and we got to make it easier for you. We got to add a bunch of stuff that, you know, other people have. So you, we have your account, we got your deposits, you get your credit journey, you get free bill pay, you get free, you know, uh, risk rewards, you get free offers, you get free this, you get free trading. It's pretty good. So we're trying to offer the customer more and more, which will appeal to customers in general. You know, we're not trying to gamify or anything like that, but we want to be there for customers younger and older. And so, uh, and I think we've been quite successful at it mm -hmm. and more to come. I think so, some of these things, you know, Marianne just gave you a snippet of travel and offers, more to come. Could you touch on the credit card environment and how you differentiate as a credit card issuer and, and a payment provider in a very competitive environment and, and maybe what you're doing, you know, with, with yeah. travel and some of the engagement yeah. stuff? Yeah, so payments, I think payments is kind of probably the most challenged, uh, you know, and people talk about like, like it's all, it's not all challenged. JP Moore moves seven, $10 trillion a day around the world, very cheap, very effective through our AML systems, our BSA systems, our risk and fraud systems, 99.9999 accuracy and all that. But some parts are challenged. We're trying to move money overseas. So people are looking at that whole ecosystem, trying to reduce the cost and the price to merchants or consumers. And we have to make sure we do that too. I just, I think it's a whole thing. And of course, obviously, credit card on the consumer side, credit card, debit card, and all the other payment systems, ACH and wires and all that, make it easier and better for customers, which we intend to do. So in credit card, we've got the brand, our brand, you know, Sapphire, Chase Cards, and, and uh, things like that. And then we got wonderful co-brands, Southwest, United, uh, you know, great partner companies that kind of enhance our system of travels and stuff like that. So... What we want to do is give you better travel packages and better rewards programs and better offers that are more targeted to you, more personalized in a way that you really like using those platforms. And 
we're convinced it's a great strategy and we have to execute, but I think you're going to see that, you know, early, early, you know, late this year, early next year, some really neat stuff coming. And then just more broadly on technology, the costs of it and, and, and the benefits of it, right? It's that, that, that's the other thing, by the way, you, it, about data. You know, we protect people's data and privacy. You know, a lot of other people out there in the financial service, they're selling that data all the time. You know, we're, we don't. We're not allowed to, but we can use it to help you on risk or fraud or marketing. And we can partner with someone without giving away data where we can offer you something better. And so that, you know, that is both a plus and a minus how you look at how banks get, get to use data and stuff like that. So, um, and that will be a big asset, I think, hopefully one day. Mm -hmm. And you've touched on this in the past, but could you help us kind of demystify a little bit what moving to the cloud means for JP Morgan? Yeah, well, we've been writing about it for years. Digital, cloud, and AI are all, they're all related and they're real. Okay, the cloud allows you to do enormous compute. I think uh, Laurie Beer gave a thing that you go from like one server to 14,000 servers to do a bunch of calculations all the way down to one. You can't even do that in our big data centers. You know, and it's unbelievable compute. That compute, when you can access multiple databases, in a split second to do something for you for risk or fraud or marketing is extraordinary. That compute power was in the private cloud or the public cloud. So you have to put, you could put stuff in the public cloud that you need unbelievable compute, stuff which you don't need it, it's very steady, you don't have to. It's all different, but you have to spend the time to refactor and replatform data and apps so they're cloud eligible. It's in the private cloud or the public cloud. The new data says we have are going to reduce the operating cost, the actual operating cost of running something, you know, by 20, 30, or 40 percent, and make it accessible to machine learning and stuff like that. Because we can do machine learning in our in the our own data centers or in the public cloud. So it, that's a journey. You know, it's, I tell people what you really want to do is constantly innovate. A lot of stuff is already in the cloud, already has AI ML, and you know, some of the stuff you may never do. Like there's certain mainframe applications, you're going to run it just that way and you retire it one day or, you know, build a new cloud eligible one. But a lot of it, the stuff around has already been put in the cloud. So you may not change the mainframe, but all the stuff for digital, compute, AI, ML, you, you're slowly moving the cloud too. So I say innovate, but it's a slog. You know, it's like, it's like hard work to get all the stuff there. You could look to any company that does it and, uh, you know, but you need to do it. And if you don't do it right, you know, you'll be at a huge disadvantage down the road. Yes, and how hard is it for smaller banks to compete? And as we've seen the consolidation of certain products like mortgages and credit cards, uh, do yeah. you see deposits getting consolidated into the hands of bigger banks and other products as well? And is there still a role for smaller banks? Yeah, I, look, I think you're gonna see a lot of consolidation, you know, and I, and I think they need it. I mean, I think you need economies of scale. As you know, consolidation is really hard, you know, social names and consolidating systems. And then you're gonna have a lot of people, third parties, who offer cloud-based type of benefits to smaller banks. So it isn't like they can't have them at all. They're going to get them from the third party. Some of those third parties, I'm not going to talk about any names and stuff like that, are ahead of others. Some of the banks are doing it, some don't. I always think a, re a very well-run community bank or regional bank can do well. It's just going to be very well-run. you got local knowledge and local people, and local authority, and, and you know, they sit in the local boards. And they, you know, they, but they have to accommodate it, too, because clients do walk with their feet. They've got to offer these, you know, some of these great services and products to their clients too. And, and, and it's not possible. I mean, if you look at the world out there, you know, all these fintech companies, if you combine them all, have four, five, six hundred million accounts in America. They're only in 150 million households. So you, you take them all, they've got their their they're, you know, so J.P. Morgan may have 66 million. We may have all these deposits, but there's this, you know, there's these people chipping away at every single piece of it. We can't all win. It's not possible. And what you see now is like, you know, and you see people or like fintechs are deepening. Some will lose. You know, it's very easy to cherry pick. So like I remember when SoFi was first coming out and said, oh, student loans. You know, the price was one was the same for everybody. But I'll take your student loan if you went to Harvard, Princeton, or Yale. Little did they know how little that meant, but uh, um, <laughs> no. But seriously, they were just cherry picking credit. That's happened my whole life. You know, now they want your investment account, your checking account, your debit account, your this account. That means they have to compete with us too. Uh, that's a whole different ball game for them. Well, we'll see. 
you know, some will do it well and some won't. And uh, I think Square's done a great job and a whole bunch of different stuff. But, you know, then is it they, they charge customers to take your money out. Their revenue stream is charging you one and a half percent to take your money out. We don't charge you to take your money out or put it in. So we have, you know, huge competitive advantages and I have enormous respect for them. I'm not sure, I'm not sure that's how sustainable that model is. Some of it. You know, they're, they're building so much stuff so quickly. They're just, they're just, they're out there bobbing and weaving and they're very good at it. I know my hat's off to them. So. Great. We have a couple of minutes left. A uh, few questions here from the audience. Uh, the first one was, um, could you talk broadly about how you're thinking about your business and footprint in Asia over the next few years and, and what kind of growth investments you're making there? It's, it's the same, you know, uh, and I think we put some charts up there. Then commercial banking, we've opened offices in Asia to do more, think of not middle market, but corporate type of banking businesses, which I would put in the low risk category, by the way, but it's country by country. You know, we, there are plans for every country out there, and we want a certain share of corporate business and financial institutions business and payments businesses and trading businesses. It is country by country. Obviously, the big one is China and India, the big ones. Greater China and India. So our plans in China are pretty much the same. You know, we, we've got our full licenses. We're growing carefully. Uh, uh, and same with India, though it's harder to do business uh, in India too. So, so nothing, nothing much changed. We're just continuing to grow there. And huge, I think huge opportunity over time. And obviously Asia is going to grow faster than the rest of the world for quite a while. Just from an ESG perspective, uh, you were chairman of the business roundtable a few years ago and kind of led the effort to reconceptualize corporations to serve all stakeholders. Are banks, how are banks doing on that? How's JP Morgan First of all, just, I am a red blooded free market capitalist and I'm not woke. And, 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 and I, I think people are mistaking the shareholder stakeholder capitalism thing for being woke. Ba all we basically said for stakeholder capitalism is when you say to me, when you say to the American, forget you all, okay, there's 325 million Americans. And when you say shareholder value and fiduciary responsibility, they hear short term profit taking at the expense of employees or customers. And fiduciary, they hear white shoe, high paid lawyers protecting CEOs. All we're saying is when we wake up in the morning, what we give a shit about is serving customers, earning their respect, earning their repeat business. And we do that through employees. And that's what we do. And obviously, we want to earn shareholder value and stuff like that. So it's just why should we get buttonholed into a stupid legal debate? So all your general counsels, you know, are going to say, oh, you, you're a fiduciary, you're vital. Yeah, so what? Explain to the American public what you do and why you do it. And of course, and when we do things like climate, we're quite serious about climate. I don't think America is getting climate right. I think the chance of getting it right is virtually nil. I don't think we remotely understand the complexity of this. And we, we, we can't turn on electricity from hydroelectric power is much less. And then we're going to reduce oil and gas, which is going to cause more CO2. And, you know, we're just, we're, just, we're not getting it right because it's an uncoordinated, we're confused between tr hugging trees and, and yelling at uh, lending. And it's just way off base. There's no, we need real leadership in this area and we're not getting it. And so, uh, and then other stuff, you know, we like, we, we want, if you're an employee of ours and whether you're black or white, Jewish or Muslim, Indian, Asian, disabled, LGBT plus, we want you to be treated with respect in our company. We want to give you opportunity. That's not woke. That's what I want from my, what we want for you, that you can contribute to the company to the best of your ability. So any senator or congressman says that's woke, they're not thinking clearly. Because I want to win in the marketplace. I want the best employees. I want happy employees. And so, but some of the other stuff we don't get involved in because it's, it is woke. You know, that, I don't think people should get involved in some of these issues where it's far more detailed than you think. And, you know, people are just getting jazzed up about, you got to do this and you got to, no, you don't. No, you don't. You know, uh, so I, you know, I agree with it. I think some people are overdoing it. And, uh, uh, and I think, I think like, I think we, like I, I mentioned these, this hurricane, part of that hurricane is the higher oil prices which I think are in the cards. And I just, I just, I'm watching that train coming down the tracks and I'm very sad about it. I, I don't know. I wake up every morning. I'm quite sad about it. Just the, this last question in terms of succession, succession planning, um, you know, it sounds like you're going to be in the seat as a leader at JP Morgan Chase for four plus more years. Um, how is the board using that time to prepare your yeah. succession? So it's, it's totally, remember, it's totally up to the board. 
And so whatever, anything I say, it's up to the board. I have 10 board members who decide every day whether they want me in this job or not. I'm an employee at will. They could fire me tomorrow. The, I think you know, I was, when I went up to Fidelity and Wellington, I explained to them that the most important thing, and I think sometimes the press misses this too, is does the board meet without the chairman and CEO all the time? Not is there a chairman and CEO. My, the lead director has all the authority of a chairman. They meet every single time since I got to Bank One. It's not required by law. Now it's required, I think, once a year under Dodd-Frank. But I have insisted every single time they hear they get full access to the management team, full access to everything. They go play golf with them. They go play lunch with them. They meet not just my direct report. They know them well, but they meet the next layers down. And, and they meet every single time without me. And they have since 2000. And they have an open conversation about what's working, what's not working, what feedbacks we give Jamie, what we're happy with, what we're not happy with. And, and that's what they do. That is the most important thing. And, um, and while I'm making a pitch to you all, you, 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 corp, corporate America has a problem, okay? And the problem is, and I think investors have to do this. I, I can't. So think of asset managers. We've gone from 7,200 public companies in 1996 and this may be a real problem. I'm begging you to pay attention to it when you go home. Okay, we've gone from seven two thousand to X packs like forty two hundred. Now, that number should have gone from seven thousand to fourteen thousand. And what happened? Well, private equity. I'm only talking about the big ones because I can't even add up all the smaller ones. Has gone. I'm not against private equity. I'm just pointing out some facts. Has gone from only one thousand to ten thousand companies. And all this other capital is moving private. I'm not against private capital. I'm not against private equity. I'm just wondering why that's taking place. And you think someone would be thinking about what do you want in America? Do you want active public markets? And we're driving companies out of the public markets because of litigation, regulation, uh, uh, press, cookie quarter governance. You know, oh, you got to have this amount of directors and this amount of that. And who said so? What's wrong with the free market system where you, you see companies? I mean, what's independent mean? Or Warren Buffett will tell you independent, independent minded. You know, there's not anything else. If you rely on fees, you're not independent, you know? So we, and so, but private equity, management teams focus on the business, boards focus on the business. You know, they, they don't, they're not, they can, they can come up with the comp schemes they think work the best for that business. They don't have to deal with Glass Lewis and ISS which shame on you if any of you, if that's how you vote, shame on you. I mean, seriously, you should be embarrassed, okay? And, and do your own homework. And this shit I hear from people about, well, you know, there's too many, pro no, there's not. If you own 100 companies, you know, the average proxy's got six, that's 600, there may be 10 that matter. And like, even that, you know, I, so we talk to our investors and we, you know, we send up, you know, the, I don't do it. The lead director does and stuff like that. So the lead director goes up there and they talk to a 27 year old compliance officer who writes a memo, you know, and then votes Glass Lewis. I think, I think if we send up a director of ours, who's a decision maker, they should sit with someone from your side who's a decision maker. And you should be able to say to that person on the spot, you got my vote or you don't, as opposed to we have to wait to the proxy day. And, you know, and I, I just think we're just slowly destroying corporate America for all the wrong reasons. And, you know, if you don't fix it, folks, you're you better go private, too, because you're not going to be enough public companies. It's, I don't think it's good for America because I think our active, transparent markets are great. They have been one of the engines with all the flaws we've had. They've been one of the engines here. So I'm begging you. I'm begging you, don't allow this to happen with no forethought. Figure out what it's going to look like in 10 years and see if that's acceptable. Because in, in my view, it's not. Jamie, thanks so much for joining us today. We appreciate thanks. it. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. <laughs>